So first and foremost, thank you to everyone for uh, coming here today. Everyone has very busy schedules, um, but we feel really fortunate to have this group um, to discuss some of the most pressing things facing the crypto space. Really, um, everyone that was invited and is here right now, we, we chose you all not because we all have the answers, but because we're all asking the same questions. Um, and I think that's how we would like to approach today in terms of, okay, there are these, these questions that crypto has to face in terms of regulation or scalability or potential recentralization vectors. Um, and we don't know how it's all going to play out, um, but it's discussions like this that allow us to better predict the future. Uh, so the day will run, as you guys saw in the invite, in, th in three discussions. Um, the first discussion is going to be moderated by my partner Joel um, on regulation and state. Um, I will moderate the second discussion after lunch on scalability. Um, scalability goes beyond just technical, there's social and regulatory scalability aspects as well. Um, and Brad will be uh, moderating the third discussion um, on potential recentralization vectors within crypto. Um, a few ground rules for each discussion. Uh, as much as we crypto folk love our forks, um, let's keep conversation single threaded. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's just for the sake of the, of the group and we have put in plenty of blank space throughout the day for side discussions. Um, also, we know crypto can be an adversarial space, but as much as possible, even if we disagree with one another, to uh, keep things polite. Um, we can be intellectually honest, yet polite. Um, and thirdly, if um, people need to take a call or an emergency comes up, there is a roof upstairs that some of you may have seen already. Um, it will get warmer through the day. There's the reception area. Um, and so that should be, uh, should make it convenient for everyone. Um, Brad, did you have anything you wanted to, to add? The, you know, the only thing that I was going to add, you've already mentioned, which is that this is uh, all about sort of exploring ideas. Um, and I, you know, there are no right answers, so there is no possibility of being right or wrong. But uh, if you approach this, you know, given the, the brain power that's around it, in the circle here, I think we can make a lot of progress if we all are approaching it from the perspective of you know, how, how do we push the ideas further, how do we explore them, how do we stay on the thread and, and you know, sort of extend the, you know, the threads as opposed to you know, diving off into any uh, particular rabbit hole. Great. Which can happen in this space. Yes. So um, <coughs> with that, we're going to do a quick round of introductions. Um, for the most part, everyone is here because everyone already knows who you are. Um, so please keep it a brief one to two sentences. We're going to try and get through through everyone, um, and then we'll kick off with the regulation session. So I'll start and I'll pass it to you. Ollie. I'm Chris Berniski. I'm a partner at Placeholder. I'm Ali Yakia, and I'm a at Adrian Horowitz. Dennis Nazarov at Adrian Horowitz. <coughs> Alex Felix at Coinfund. Jake Brooklyn at Coinfund. Brian Shea, Blockstack. Rick Rosen at Box Group. Nick Charles, Notation. <coughs> Philip at Bluegar. <coughs> Ashley, I'm Kim Aaron Wright, I'm at Carter's Law School. Watch you who? Latham and Watkins. Vivian May, Latham and Watkins. Joel Monet, Rock Placeholder. Sandra Rowe, Ewing Corp. And I'm going to wear a second hat as um, GBBC, the Global Blockchain Business Council. Josh Clayman, Morrison and Forrester, and WSBA. Fred Wilson, USV. Ariana Simpson, Autonomous Partners. Dan Avalon, Two Sigma Ventures. Hey guys, I'm Lane Reddick. I'm an Ethereum researcher and core developer and founder of Crypto MIT. Uh, Kieran O'Leary, Blue Yard. Kristen Catalini, MIT Crypto Economics Lab. Brian Selkis, Wasari. I can also speak to Onchain FX. And Jonathan Sella from Fox by uh, Nick, <coughs> Nick Grossman from USV. Karen Batia from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Brad Burnham from USB and Placeholder. Wendy Shashadek from North South Ventures. <coughs> Daniel Brenner from Zeppelin. Doug Mechanics from Lacker. Jesse Waldman from Ventures and Harvest. <coughs> Alex Darius from OS Coin. Sam Hart from New Computers. Slava Balasano uh, from River Oven. And let's start yeah, with, Jeff, with John. Uh, Cheeseman <coughs> from uh, Distributed Global. Hi, Brian Hutchings, Gunderson Network. Hi, Travis Chair, Digital Currency Group. 
Hi, Chris Green is from Aragon, and I do some work with the Ethereum main service as well. Hi, Jeff Bellingham at Chainalysis. Jason Wigmeyer at New York. Uh, hi, uh, Gustav Simons on at the Orchid. Hi, everyone. Mario Lau, I'm with Facebook. Uh, Chris Allen, Chris, Q4. Rick Dudley, uh, Volkerais. Saida Free, Placeholder. Excellent. Um, and for me, there is no back row. Maybe I'm too much uh, uh, bred by educators, but um, everyone should feel free, free to participate at any time. So I'm about to pass it over to Joel. Um, as we get this first session underway, you'll notice we haven't announced any panelists. Um, and that's because anyone here could be a panelist. And so while Joel will start with some curated questions to curated audience members or attendees, if you feel the urge to say anything, um, you can jump in at any time. There's no point at which the ends and the discussion begins. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Joel. Thank you. So we thought we'd start with the media's topic, uh, regulation and the role of the state uh, to start the morning. Um, I think it's something that everyone has been thinking about in different ways, over, especially over the last couple of months, as we see more and more governments and regulators and states and countries begin to ask the questions around how to regulate this space. And there's a bunch of issues that we need to resolve, both as a community and as, a, as investors, as entrepreneurs, as creators. And in particular, when engaging with regulators, we found that there is a disconnect between uh, the things that we say and the things that uh, governments hear for good reasons. And so I think it's something that everyone here has been trying to figure out in their own lives and their own practice. We have uh, a, a particular group of people among us that have been uh, working very hard on this topic. We've got uh, Vivian Mays from Latham and Watkins and uh, her partner, Wenchi, who um, uh, when she used to be at the SEC, you were Director of Market Infrastructure, if I'm um, going back correctly. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I used to uh, supervise the, uh, um, actually, the market infrastructure. Um, Vivian is also a partner at Latham and Watkins and has been uh, working in crypto now for a long time. For a long time. So I, I can, I, my distinguishing factor that impresses everybody is that I had to borrow Bitcoin from Roger Baer. <laughs> in 2013, so that was my, which in uh, in crypto terms is wow. uh, ancient history. It is ancient history. And you made it into a rap song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you told me that. That is, I, I, I must have listened to that song maybe 50 times trying to make sure, does it really say Vivian May's Bitcoin in this rap song, which was fascinating. It was a fascinating and surprising, it just opened a whole other dimension to technology for me. <laughs> We've got Aaron Wright at Cardozo Law School. Yeah, yeah, so I'm at Cardozo Law School. Yeah, I've really just been trying to bring a whole bunch of different people together. Uh, I'm also involved with the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. I chair the legal industry working group that has about 30 law firms. Uh, so everybody from Lock Hell, uh, Deadline, and most, mostly annual of 100 law firms. We could say like them in Lock Hell. Yeah, obviously, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, with Consensus, I helped put together the Brooklyn Project, which is really trying to do this from a grassroots perspective. So we've got a thousand people that are collaborating on various different um, aspects of thinking about uh, the token ecosystem, uh, most notably, um, routinely talk to, to regulators. I think it's interesting because you, you said that um, in conversations with regulators, you're not seeming to make headway. I think we've actually had the opposite uh, approach. So. Um, I feel like we're actually finding a common ground, All right. which has been really helpful. Um, and happy to share as much as I, I can about that. We'll definitely go with that. Yeah, and then beyond that, you know, I'm a programming lawyer, uh, and I've been building a project called Open Law, which is really an agreement slayer that's been set on top of the Ethereum. So that's another little piece that I did. Inspiring coders are the My sister calls me a unicorn. I'm in the book piece. That's really <laughs> Well, I used to code. I was systems analyst before I went to law yeah. school, and I've been waiting for this moment for everything to converge. <laughs> yeah. We've also got Damien Brenner. Um, Here. There you are. Yeah, uh, Damien is one of the founders of Cephalin and also has been working on a regulatory framework called TPL. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer. Sorry. My dad is. You know, yeah, that's a there. Um, so, 
we at Zeppelin, we have a smart contract development framework. We do a lot of security audits through so smart contracts, and we're working on an operating system or a platform for building smart contract applications. So we get a good sense uh, of what the main issues and challenges our clients are facing. It's kind of inside information based on our users and our clients. So that we, we translate all that into, you know, try to build solutions from a technology perspective. Um, that's why we came up with TPL trans transaction permission layer, which I can then tell you more about that if you're interested. There's basically a mechanism that to reduce malicious behavior in an economy um, by a self-regulatory mechanism or framework that is governed by the network and that can be enforced on chain. And last but not least, because I'm starting with you, uh, is uh, Ryan Selkis from Masari. Um, Ryan, do you, uh, well, a, a little bit of context. Ryan uh, used to be at uh, Coindesk and DCG, and uh, look for you to introduce Masari. Sure. Um, so thank you for having me kick things off, I guess. Um, the, the concept behind Masari is to build an open data library that covers the universe of crypto assets and gives everybody from professional investors and regulators and, and retail consumers the same level of field when it comes to information about these assets. Um, and we kind of came at this from two angles. The first is looking at some of the SEC's recent language um, that uh, basically the, the chairman has come out and said these are all securities and they're going to have to be regulated as such. We don't agree with that. Um, but if you look at the spirit of what the SEC is trying to do and, and its mission, is to facilitate capital formation, protect investors, and, and, and create fair and efficient markets. And capital formation in this industry is not really a problem, but the latter two certainly are when you have uh, dynamics where professional funds can crowd in to private rounds at a discount, and then in many cases these projects are literally paying you know, 10x what would be standard in public markets with no disclosure framework to list on exchanges and then offer these same tokens to its retail investors. So it's the duck test, right? Looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And that's what the SEC has said. Um, now, we think that there's a better um, free market solution to uh, abiding by the spirit of the law if we can get enough collective interest uh, on part of projects to abide by certain common sense disclosures. Um, and we're starting pretty basic, not with a 26 or you know, 35 section filing document that would look like an S1, but very simply just trying to get project 101 information like who are the principals, where are they domiciled, who are represented by a law firm, and then supply information. What does their treasury look like? What is their distribution? And is there any encumbrance to any of these tokens um, over time? How do these things get unwound? How are the treasuries managed? And ultimately, who controls the keys? Um, our thinking is that these assets are very much on a spectrum when they are centrally owned and operated as any project is when it first starts, uh, including Bitcoin, by the way, right? And launched and it was, you know, like Satoshi and Alpha and just pre-mining all these coins just because no one else is paying attention. Um, you get to a point where it is forkable and it's, it's something that can be decentralized and I think some of these utility tokens can ultimately migrate and become um, non secure to actual consumer uh, tokens. Um, that doesn't change this inside or outsider dynamic in terms of how they trade. And so I think uh, the more disclosures that we have, the better. Uh, the good teams will, um, and in many cases, are, are transparent. And a couple of them are here Aragon and Zeppelin, I think, are, are, are two of, of the best when it comes to transparency initiatives already. Um, and, um, and there's a market need here, not just um, from a, a regulatory fear standpoint, um, but also tying back to Coindesk days, how do you get common data from these projects um, when there is no enforcement mechanism from on high to report anything like generally accepted accounting principles or IFRS or uh, on any regular cadence or, or, or with any consistency? Um, I think if we can build something that's truly open source, free, accessible to everybody, then this goes a layer down from the 30 other projects that are building themselves as the quote unquote Bloomberg's <coughs> for, for cryptocurrency. Um, and ensures that all of those services can pull from, so for at least to the same language across the assets. So you mentioned the, the coin disk space, and one of the things that uh, <coughs> Strike me about your background is that you've been you've been in this space for a long time and you've seen it grow over the last ten years uh, in in the sense that uh, it's 
kind of crazy to think sometimes that Bitcoin is 10 years old and uh, blockchain is probably seven years old and crypto is only probably two, three years old. And now we're having these conversations with, with, with governance and we've seen it grow from precisely that small group of miners early on, that kind of uh, cyberpunk crypto uh, anarchist bent to now having these conversations with, with regulators. Um, how have you, have you seen that evolution in the space and, and how do you think about uh, the history and does it, does it impact how we think about regulating the space? Um, well, that's, a, that's a broad question. Well, a lot has changed. Um, when I first got into the industry, I think you know, there was probably 20 people working in funded companies at that point, so um, full time that is. Um, and I think the fear at that point was mostly around AML, KYC, and you know, Silk Road had just gotten shut down. And, and um, you know, uh, my, uh, uh, the reason I got to know so many great people in this industry has, has to do with the collapse of Mount Gox, um, which, uh, which uh, I, I leaked the documents that. Ryan broke Mount Gox, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> Ryan was a great idiot and he broke Mount Gox before anyone else knew. So, uh, so investor protection was a concern uh, for a long time. Um, I think, you know, the, the one thing that immediately comes to mind, having kind of lived through the, that, which I, I was sure, and many others were sure was going to kill the industry, the collapse of Gox, um, just because the regulatory platform had gone. Um, but through that kind of winter of 2014, 2015, what, what I consistently saw was anytime there's something that you say, like, this is going to kill the industry, um, a team steps up and builds a company that solves the problem, right? Um, and this this has happened, and I think will continue to happen pretty much in perpetuity, um, regardless of what happens down in DC and, and, and how the conversation materializes, because um, tokens are not going away uh, just based on how successful they are as a capital formation tool. Uh, utility tokens are not going away. Uh, even if the SEC comes in and cracks down, a lot of these things, you know, the, the, the concept of something like Filecoin, which you use for, as like an Airbnb type tool for, for, for file storage, being secured, which is laughable. So if, if, if there really was a red line that the SEC took, um, a lot of innovators are just going to wrap around the US. Um, so people will still build around that and, and build solutions for that ecosystem. And then whatever else, you know, might materialize um, in the future, I, I think people will step up to solve it. And, uh, you know, of course, in our case, um, I think we want to play a leading role in, in educating the regulators and saying, like, let's fit within the spirit of the existing laws and allow a thousand innovations to move. So, yeah. I, I just have a slightly different point of view, sort of being in the technology space <laughs> on Wall Street for more years than I'm willing to acknowledge at this point, um, and then being sort of my practice has two sides to it, has a merchant company side to it, um, innovative technologies and uh, tier one types. So just benchmarking what the tenor of the conversations were um, back in 2014. So when I think about um, a technology that I've seen, I've never seen anything go from disreputable to uh, disruptive in such a short period of time. And the benchmark for me was actually regulation. I don't like the regulation, nobody likes it. But when New York State stepped in with the, uh, the DFS stepped in with their crypto regulations, I think that was a turning point in um, legitimacy. I think that that really caused people to say, um, okay, there's a regulation here, at least people I know. Um, there's a regulation here, and so let's start taking this seriously, at least in the, you know, the, the, the bigger Wall Street halls. And it's, it's taken a relatively short period of time for when you know, my early clients couldn't get banked for compliance reasons, um, to now um, watching banks step into the space and seeing it as a competitive advantage. So I, I think regulation was, necess was a good thing in terms of legitimizing uh, cryptocurrency, crypto assets. So you indirectly touched on uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about, which is the element of jurisdictional competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were seeing it both inside the United States, with New York being the first one to step in, and we're seeing more and more states start to ask Wyoming. <laughs> Wyoming <laughs> and ago, right? And it's becoming part of, of a, a political movement. message. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's, um, 
So it, it, there's a lot of interesting uh, topics or questions around uh, what's going on in the United States that's leading uh, states to try and think about, okay, how can we use this to revitalize our economy and so on. But there's also jurisdictional competition on a global basis. We've got uh, other countries outside of the US uh, starting to uh, compete for, for this space. And one of the things that has been nagging us as investors is actually we've been seeing more and more companies and more and more entrepreneurs uh, avoid US investors, which is a problem for us because we, and for many of us, because we are investors in the United States. Um, curious, to, uh, in your experience working with these teams, have you seen more of that? Have you seen more teams scared and working with US investors? Um, yes and no. So, right across the timeline, um, as the, there was a period of time in the not too distant past, like last summer, um, where it felt like there was more harmony around the world. And um, as the SEC last summer began with the Dow report and kind of moved forward um, closer and closer to at least having a clear set of rules, Jay will tell you it's all about investor protection. It's all about protecting the, you know, the, uh, the mom and pop, you know, at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, but watching the, the movement um, and now being in a place where we're pretty clear how this should behave, but how it should behave um, is a fairly expensive way um, to raise money. It takes the best down the securities now. Um, so when we're talking to clients, Wenchi and I um, have a global platform. Latham is lucky to be in 30 different countries. We have a team of 75 lawyers around the world who um, actually are in, in the space from a currency through um, asset, depending on how you want to structure that space. So we are, like, like most companies that come to us, trying to think about um, what's the best regulatory arbitrage um, for the goals of that particular investor. So sometimes the US um, has to be excluded if, uh, if the investor wants you know, a pure token to play, like a play token. They just want to raise money. They're not particularly serious. There's a trading element to monetization that you know seems to be a passion for some, uh, but not for others. Others want a more classic investment. So depending on where you fall on that that spectrum, you will either want to be, you know, in the UK or Singapore or Hong Kong uh, versus you know being in the US. But there's definitely uh, a disharmony. It's not unique to this space. Um, it's there's global competitive regulation. There's internal in you know in, within the U.S. I mean, one of the, the pluses on the jurisdictional side is that for the first time in a really long time, um, you saw the head of the SEC and the head of the CFTC actually speak together. You know, which has not been the case for a long period of time. I don't fully buy the regulatory arbitrage piece, frankly. Uh, I think people are waiting to see what the U.S. does. So you have Singapore, which, which acted early into the NAS, provided somewhat clear guidelines. My understanding is they're willing to move from those, subject to what the U.S. does. So I think the U.S. is sorting this out. I think Europe's going to follow the U.S. speed. I think other jurisdictions will likely uh, follow the lead of the U.S., U.K., and the EU. I, I don't. I think there's a lot of confusion about what the SEC is saying. Uh, I don't believe that the final position will be that every single token is a security. I think they're, they recognize and understand that. Um, I don't think it's sensible or a reasonable position to assume that the U.S. is going to take an anti-technology position. Uh, I think the real problem here, and I'm, it, to take this up a step, it's not that dissimilar than what, with what happened with the internet and copyright. Right? Mm -hmm. So we started with copyright uh, issues emerging early on with the internet. There was, frankly, some really bad arguments that were being made about copyright law uh, in terms of fair use, et cetera, that ultimately got shut down, shut down by the courts. Uh, but we found a, a medium. Now, people will disagree whether or not that's the appropriate medium and people at the end of uh, But there was a sort of stasis that was eventually but together, there was some surgical uh, legislation that was passed with the NPA and the CBA that really allowed the whole ecosystem to flourish. I don't think it's that dissimilar here. We've got a set of laws that's really flexible. A lot of these issues are not that new. You, when you mine through things, you go through the case law and really understand what's going on. There's plenty of room within existing case law to place things like utility tokens within existing frameworks. There's some hair on it. 
um, that may need to get sorted out. Uh, it may not be perfect, it may not capture all the economic value that, that needs to get captured or could get captured, but that's a, that's a much different conversation than what's happening now. I think the issue is really, it was flimsy legal analysis that was supporting a lot of what was going on, and that flimsy legal analysis was frankly borderline offensive to those that have operated in this space because it wasn't well supported, and it put them in a bind. You literally have people taking positions that were so, un so ill-supported under existing law that they had to act. And, and on top of it, it was being aggressively marketed and sold, and people were getting hurt. You know, go to YouTube and look at all the crypto traders that are frankly pumping coins. I mean, that's problematic. Yeah. You, know, you have to do something. As regular, you have to do something. So they're going to do something, I imagine. But with it, I, I, my belief is that we'll see a glimmer of path forward as well. And we're going to see that emerge. Uh, simultaneously, because that's frankly that's what we do here in America. And then once that comes into into play, we're going to see Europe fall in line. Switzerland's probably going to do its, its own thing. Cause it does its own thing. Can't it's fine. Switzerland. Is going to do its own thing. Because Switzerland does its own thing. It's fine. And then I think you're going to see the jurisdictions kind of fall suit. Everyone's talking. Let's let one you go and then maybe yeah. spread it. And I'm particularly interested also to hear from your perspective. Should we be afraid of the SEC? You know, coming from oh, the absolutely not. Um, okay. So I'm not as uh, optimistic as Aaron that anybody will follow the U.S. But I completely agree with Aaron that uh, whatever is going on in the U.S. in the last few months uh, uh, is definitely the right thing to do, and it's healthy. And um, you know, we see so many bad things happening. It's bad for the community if the people believe that that's what this community is doing. Um, However, having been through a lot of international negotiation at CBS, CBS or CPMI, I ask a level, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, there is a definitely regulatory uh, and uh, market competition going on here. And uh, I do observe that I believe it's only short term, you know, whether it's long term or not, it's yet to be seen um, that investors temporary, at least for now, uh, if they can, they're trying to avoid the U.S. Um, so I, I do observe that. But a lot of investors that we speak to, uh, they also say, look, uh, even the companies, they say, well, look, I live here. You know, I'm not going to avoid this market. You know, I wanted to do business here. And I understand, um, you know, the regulation imposes a hurdle. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that when you apply the existing framework, and another big problem I see is that when you apply existing framework, and I totally agree with SEC's viewpoint that protecting <coughs> the investor, you know, when you want to do fundraising, you should apply securities law, well, but there's there are difficulties when you apply existing framework to this new asset class, to a utility token, everybody sees a lot of issues. Uh, and so, for that reason, people are struggling. You know, we do see a lot of companies, a lot of investors, they are struggling. They, they say that I'm totally okay with the complying with securities law, but how do I trade my tokens? You know, that, yeah. that's a very big the issue. Post sale issues. So right. the offering issues are easy, easier to deal with, but the post sale issues are a disaster. Right. So right. keeping everything as a security is just not tenable. You just can't do it. Um, it's gonna create a lot of complex problems. Well, so the question is, uh, you know, how, how do we go from there? You know, is that then what? We all accept now, you know, we all have to apply security law and what. So there's a difference between do you use tokens to do fundraising and these are the you use token for your own protocol, you know, for whatever purposes. And going back to the competitive landscape, um, you know, for example, you know, uh, as Vivian said, after the Dow report was issued, I did see some sort of a harmony, you know, like Singapore came out right after SEC, I, I, you know, even UK, you know, I, I debated with my UK German colleagues, that, you know, they, they all say that, no, US is a very different from us, but at a high level, I actually see a lot of uh, synergies because I say, how, is, how, how are we different from you? Because all we're doing, we're all saying that tokens may be securities, you know, so, the question comes down to, you know, what is the definition of securities? If certain countries say, well, this token, they, they even have a more finer line that securities, other financial instrument, or some people even, German lawyers even have uh, another category and say it could be 
uh, so-called financial instrument or options or derivatives. That depending on the design of token, and they will apply all types of different law. So at the end of the day, I think um, it's not different from all the old issues, whether it's a copyright, whether it's a central clearing, whether it's a you know all these issues. At the end of the day, uh, at the international level. I would say there's going to be uh, a very, very um, vehement debate at the international level, and the countries will negotiate as to um, what is the common standard, and if there is anything that at the international level that the standard setting body would like to come out with some recommendation. But even if they come out with some recommendations, some countries, such as US, will say that, well, that's not the law. We're not going to abide. And UK tend to be the country they will adhere to the international standards if everybody at the international meeting agree to that. So, uh, and another factor I want to point out is that in UK, because of Brexit issues, and I think they tend to be much more open minded and wanted to attract companies and business. So that's also another factor that they may not necessarily follow, at least they may not like the outcome in the US right now. Yes. I wanted to yeah. add a little bit of data to, to that point about jurisdictions. <clears throat> so we did a full scale population level study of 1,800 tokens. And we definitely see uh, that capital is moving to new regions. And, and there's that dependency. Economic clusters only last for so long. I think Silicon Valley was lucky to survive a number of them. Um, Singapore and Switzerland have not attracted more fraud and scams, have attracted better teams, uh, and there's people building. Those teams are located there. So we, we went after, you know, are the team members actually in that jurisdiction or not? And I think it's a very US-centric view to have, which is, you know, once the US regulates, everybody will follow. Take privacy, for example. I think it's going quite the opposite way, uh, given recent events. Um, yeah, recent events, especially. <laughs> right. And, and so, at least in the data, and I think the, the challenge around tokens has been that there's been a fair degree of misinformation. How, how many of these are frauds? How many of these look more like VC fundable um, events? Um, and, and we just need better facts and, and bring those to the policymakers and show that, sure, there's a fair degree of fraud and scam. And, you know, in our estimates, it's somewhere between <coughs> 5%, which is you know, straight up frauds and scam, people run away with the money, to maybe one out of four, which is extremely high. Uh, but if going back to Ryan, increasing the disclosures, making sure that you know where these people are even located, who they are, uh, do they have a GitHub, what's the code base. There's a lot that can be done to clean up the marketplace, uh, but still keep entrepreneurial uh, experiments alive. Because I don't think, you know, when you go in the top 20% in our estimates, I don't think anybody can tell which one will be <coughs> trillions, trillions of dollars and which one will be failures. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's important to tell our policymakers too that um, although these objects may be born as securities, we need to think about what is that path, what is that transition into something that looks more like, like a commodity, uh, what are the steps required. Uh, the, 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 the problem I have with utility tokens is that from an economic theory perspective, once you formalize what tokens do, the appreciation, that, that level of security-like phase, it's extremely important. And if you throw that out, you've essentially turned back to the old regime where we could have done these tokens before, issuing on a centralized ledger of sorts, uh, but you don't have the self-custody, you don't have this kind of security-like behavior that is not just for investors, it's for users taking risk in your platforms, it's for complementers that look at your platform and say, oh, if I build on that and it appreciates, I'm part of, I have skin in the game. Um, so that's where I, I, I struggle, and I think the challenge is bringing together C SEC and CFTC and thinking through if there's both private investors that are holding tokens, do we lock them down? Do we kind of dribble uh, their ability to dump them on the market so that we can get these things that look more like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but probably we will start as securities because the teams will have so much control over what happens in that ecosystem. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that price appreciation piece is the concern. It's really, uh, I'm, I don't think under the law there's really a basis to say that just because something's going to appreciate in value that it's going to be a security. If the main reason you're buying it is pretty appreciation, well, it's going to that, be a security that's a in the US. That's a different question. Um, but it also is at the time of the sale what, 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 whether or not you're buying it. So you can imagine a world where users are the ones that are the focus of launching these networks, and as use goes up, they can sell and trade things. That's, the that's not going to revert network effects. The only way you can you yeah. can get users to jump on is if they're getting an upset for their risk. Well, and that's can. a new construct. No, no, I mean, we didn't have before. Yeah, you, I don't mean to be sold on that piece. Um, yeah, I think that all can be baked in, but 
there's definitely significant opportunity to have things that are not born as securities. Uh, they can be just born as commodities. Well, was Bitcoin born as a security? I, I, I would argue no, and I don't think that Ether was either. Um, and I think that there's a number of other projects that, if the, the sales were structured in a more appropriate way, would have fall, would fall in that camp as well. And we are seeing more and more teams avoid sales and ICOs and, right. and selling yeah. tokens directly to investors. I think the other piece here is also if you're providing, if you're treating these things as securities, you lose governance, right? You lose governance over these projects. You can get, you can obviously bake in governance at the token level and have users participate in it, but I think you, you lose that level of sophisticated governance that the venture community has provided. Uh, so I, I do think that creating a, a bit of a line between um, having investors have direct exposure to tokens um, and, and or having consumers own them may make some sense. I think that's something, I think there's a number of reasons why you want to do that. I think pulling things out of the, the securities regime is not just sensible from a legal perspective, but it also provides a lot more flexibility to do things like you're talking about, Ryan, like to put disclosures in place. So when you, when you move outside the securities apparatus, you have a lot more flexibility legally, and you don't have to deal with this very complex, very carefully calibrated system. And that's the other piece here, right? This has to operate within a very, very carefully calibrated machine, where there's a number of different financial uh, products that are operating along with it. So the arguments and the positions are taken here that would have secondary effects on more traditional financial services products, that's problematic. You're not gonna make much headway in terms of arguments and it will make much headway in terms of, of getting regulators on board with it. So you kind of have to create a pocket that is outside the scope of securities laws, start from there, ground sensible rules like disclosures, set it around it, and get the data out there, and maybe surgically tri put some, some legislature legislation in place. Yeah, Ryan, really quick though, if we could hear from Sandra, because Sandra has wanted to say something, and I'm I'm particularly interested in Sandra's perspective because past life she had a uh, had a digitization at CME. Wait, so sort quick, of quick from is this being filmed right now? Um, live stream. Okay. Yeah. So we need to. Yeah, I yeah, know. Okay. I just, I just want to because I think probably people would say like less things than. Okay, than so we did put in the email that we are live streaming this. Um, sorry if that was not made explicitly um, uh, clear at the start. The audio quality, to be frank, may not be that great um, <laughs> for everyone to hear everything. We are recording a, um, a high fidelity audio feed. If anyone has any problems with any of that, I guess two things, don't say anything that's sensitive and come see me. Um, and when we release after the fact, we can see what we can do about scoping you. Um, sorry about that, but thank you. Um, let's start with Sandra and then I'll pop over to so, I, I just, I would like actually everyone's thoughts on this because I've been thinking about this a lot about how this whole crypto space is evolving. So when we look at sort of the whole regulatory environment right now, you've got a fixed group of financial products, which I think the way things are going, this is my opinion, is you've got basically tokens are going to be jammed into mostly a securities like regulatory box, which means if you do want to do it, you're probably not going to do it as a startup on the front end. It probably ends up being more like something you do in a series C or D or IPO like um, situation because the costs are so high to do it, which means you'll have on ramps to then probably as the crypto exchanges are regulated on their side, um, you'll have on ramps to actually list those tokens. So you could argue that could be a good thing. But what I'm trying to understand is why it seems that we're recreating the exact infrastructure for crypto that exists today. And then that's sort of for me been a real challenge to get my head around because it is happening, whether we like it or not. The MA that's already going on, it's it's obvious what's going to end up. And the back end, the custody stuff, that's all being filled in right now with almost the exact same model that I see coming from traditional infrastructure space. So that's just one commentary I've had, which is just perplexing me. And then that second level, there's also innovative things coming on board. And some of the stuff that you talked about, which is transitioning, um, you've talked about it too, which is if a token takes different forms and different attributes during its life cycle, what happens? It goes from a utility to a security. It goes from being a security to a utility. What, how do we deal with that? We have no framework for that. Um, and, and then beyond that, once we have decentralized exchanges, which I absolutely believe we will we'll have, and we'll have decentralized banking, um, what happens there? And so for me, it just, I haven't quite gotten my head around all of this, but I would love thoughts on sort of yeah. how this starts coming together. Well, there's, um, 
uh, and before uh, we go back to the conversation, you're touching on one of the most fascinating tensions and nuances here, which is that these networks are global and governments are local. And so one of the things that we're having to figure out is precisely how are we going to <coughs> reconcile that tension and what kind of tools we're going to build. At some point, I want to hear from Demian. Uh, on the work that they're doing on TPL because it's precisely trying to create a framework and create the tools and also Masari creating the framework and the tools for us to arrive at those regulations and create that infrastructure. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask a question based on what you said is um, to think whether it makes sense to replicate what's exactly working in the traditional financial space and move to the new space because now we have more tools, it's global, you know the open source nature of everything we're building make it makes it easy to fork and for people to elect um, how they want to do things. Of course, they need to comply with regulation, everything, but it's more um, powerful to the individual rather than to the institutions. Uh, and also, you can have you know rules that can be enforced on chain. You don't need to you know, impose fear for people to do something or not to do something or, or have. Since regulation being focused on the gatekeepers or the you know the kind of exchanges or wallets that hold your private keys and they act as the middleman between the traditional and the real world and the you know, uh, on-chain decentralized world. So um, I would just like to comment uh, about the. It looks like we're making an identical uh, a replication. Um, I always in my designs, you guys have probably invested in companies I architect the coins for. Um, I always do both, right? I always I always make a, a, a token or a system that could comply with the law and also that you could take custody of it. So like, I, I don't want to, well. So there's one client that I work for where I, I explicitly designed three different tokens with, uh, with a fixed exchange rate, right, within the system so that you could say, oh, this voting right is equivalent to this amount of like a uh, fee token. Right, and so if uh, that person then, so like if someone had a bunch of the fee token, which was ICO'd, they could then exchange that at a fixed rate determined by the operator uh, for a voting right. And then obviously that would have to be a KYC gateway, right? So the first step, no KYC, second step, KYC. Um, so you can do both, you can create systems where if you're an institutional investor and you need to take custody, we can facilitate that. If you're an individual and you want a utility token, um, we can facilitate that as well. I, I, I don't think that there's any reason uh, from the mechanism design or computer science perspective that you can't um, just just do both. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, what was your other, that was a, your response to one, what was your second thing? You had like a second point, like a big yeah. second point. So that was in response well, to- I, I have a question following up on that, which is, it, you know, it's you know, this idea that there could be native mechanisms that uh, allow for a different kind of regulation, and that we're, you know, we're kind of missing that opportunity because we're rushing in with a bunch of traditional models. You're talking about something that that allows for the possibility of actually. It sounded almost like competition between uh, the native mechanisms and the traditional mechanisms within a single network. If you have two different tokens that could, in theory, float in some way in value relative to each other, and they could represent different regulatory regimes within a single network. That's a really wild idea. Yeah, my clients didn't like that so much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's actually happening. I mean, yeah. King has done that with KIN. They have mm -hmm. KIN one, which is effectively going to be forced to be a security token. The SEC gets their way, built on a ERC-20. And then they have KIN two, which is a stellar token, which is a utility token which hopefully they'll be able to convince the SEC is, is a utility token, and there'll be some exchange mechanism between the two, and then all work inside a single system. These, these kinds of things are happening, actually, already, and we'll see whether those are successful or not, and whether developers want to build on those kinds of systems, and whether users want to use those kinds of systems, but I think the regulators are forcing entrepreneurs and innovators to do that right now. I think, I, I, think that I think they're forcing them, and in part why we're seeing the financialization of it, because <coughs> you're starting from this precept that it's a security. It's the problem. It's the root problem here. You need to start from the fact that it's a commodity. You need to start from that fact, because that gives you flexibility with this. Right. You're saying flexibility with decentralized exchanges? So, you, listen, there's marketplaces everywhere. If you are trading you know, security on a decentralized exchange, those folks that are developing it, they, they don't have really good arguments, and they, they're likely going to want to reject. There's, you don't have much of a first amendment argument or any other argument 
for if you're facilitating the mass massive exchange of securities, that that's going to that's going to fly well with under any any jurisdiction. To, to clarify, you're saying Kim just like Ethereum would not be a security? Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about Kim in general. Okay. Um, I'm saying that I think yeah. what, why you're seeing the re-replication no, no, is I because people you. are trying to they're they're, use, they're treating them to use Brian's terms uh, in, in a way that makes it seem very much like it's a security. So they're not choosing these products. To, to rephrase, products. You, you're saying the, 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 most of the conversation has been these things are kind of like security. Let's figure out how to get them out of the securities box. And you're saying a better approach would be start them out of the securities box exactly. uh, as the general model because we're just asking for trouble by starting them in the securities box and then trying to find a way out. Right, exactly. And, and, and there's not much of a good, right. there's not much of a good basis to to argue and or clean ways to define a transition period between this this idea of things transmuting in some sort of way has no real legal basis. There's not really clean ways to apply it from a regulatory perspective. It, it's much better um, and I think provides the flexibility so that people can do what they want to do to start from the first principle that these are not securities. Like file storage is not a security, right? It's just not. Just because it's tradable doesn't necessarily mean that it, it, it has to be a security. Sorry, can you clarify something you said? You, you said that there was a risk that uh, the uh, creators of decentralized exchanges are in violation yeah, I mean, if you're trade, if you're trading securities and you're aiding and abetting the trading of securities, um, and you're not a registered exchange, then you're going to run into some problems. So, just to give you an example, this happened with sports betting back in the '90s. It was a Ninth Circuit decision. People created sports betting software. Uh, they were prosecuted for, for doing that. They raised the First Amendment defense. The Ninth Circuit looked at it and said, "No, what you're doing is you're breaking the law, and the law doesn't protect you just because you're creating something creative or something that you can qualify as creative." I think the same thing's been happening with a lot of the, the folks that are developing software for decentralized exchanges. Do, do I think that that's necessarily the right solution? Uh, I don't, I'm not going there, but that is where the law is, and I don't see a good reason why that would change. Right? And it's where it's where to go to the right. Yes, yeah. 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 So I think, I mean, in the, with respect to the question of why we're going down the road of saying everything is a security, in a sense, or, or building this in a particular model that looks like what already exists. I think it's because we're still stuck on that first question of is it the security and people are looking for certainty. I think I, I think the regulators had to come out with something because there were some questionable activities taking place and they needed to protect investors. What I'm seeing in my practice generally is a real bifurcation. So some people are like full steam ahead. We would just want to say it's a security. We don't mind that we haven't figured out the reporting and all these other secondary questions that happen. Once you decide that something is a security, we're just going to go with it because we need to move. We have money that wants to find a, a place, right? And then some of the other projects, many of which, in my view, many of them are the better projects, so to speak, or things where there may truly be not a security. My personal view, although not representing things in my firm, um, and where there may be potentially deep pockets who risk serious reputational harm if, if it goes wrong. And they're saying, let's avoid the US right now and perhaps do a, a double pronged approach where we approach the SEC to get their views. But in the meantime, we're going to try to limit to make sure that no one who might be a US person under the definition in Reg S is anywhere involved. So meaning if they have investors, they might need to use investors that have true foreign entities, you know, not not anyone in the US. Um, and so I think that that's the way I'm seeing it, the two distinct paths. I do think though that beyond just the security, since this is about regulatory generally, I do think that so many other areas, like we keep talking about securities, of course, but there are so many things with you know privacy and data security, especially with GDPR, right? But also even if you're doing KYC AML, know your customer, any money laundering, who's checking to see what's happening with that personal data? And all, I mean, just all kinds of sanctions, questions, and um, I, I want to answer you and, and Aaron what you said that, and tell you how we're thinking about solving these problems from the TPL, TPL approach. So and what does TPL stand for? TPL stands for Transaction Information Layer. So basically, as I said before, it's an opt-in <coughs> self regulatory mechanism that is governed and elected by the network and can be enforced on chain. It mirrors how 
the ICANN domain verification systems work and how the SSL certificates work, where participants delegate, or delegate their trust to authorities that perform validation services to the participants, you know, what their identity, what their accredited investor status would be. They sign certificates for that, and then there's a consortium of trusted you know, wallets, investors, law firms, um, operating systems that they govern and elect which certificate authorities are following strict processes to perform you know, right KYC and AML verification services. And in the, in the context of TPL protocol, this consortium is called the root DAO, which eventually could become a, a DAO and governed by token holders. Um, then projects or issuers, they can, since, since participants have this certificate attesting their accreditation status and their identity, projects can introduce rules within the smart contract of the token itself, asking for participants that will be trading or holding the token to have certain um, extensions or requirements that are coded into the certificate. For example, if a project is issuing a security, they could say, okay, I only want people that are you know, US citizens and are accredited investors and can show that they own this public key to be able to trade the assets. Um, so in that way, then the TPL protocol can um, approve or reject transactions at the, you know, on chain to, um, based on if the certificate requirements are met or not. And in the same way as SSL certificates work, where browsers and operating systems they trust SSL certificates and support them natively to ensure safe connections online. You can have wallets and operating systems or decentralized exchanges supporting these TPL certificates to ensure safe connections with our trusted participants in the network. And, and the end result here is that projects can make sure that they stay compliant according to the rules that this consortium or root DAO states in every transaction or every exchange of the token beyond just initial token sale or ICO. You think one, one question, um, I'm wondering maybe TPL is the answer, is sort of rethinking the interface between regulators and protocols, because the way regulation works today is you have uh, rules, uh, forms, and data requests, and a centralized entity with liability, and a visual liability that it says that this is correct, right? And actually, Nick, I was thinking about something you wrote years ago, I think on Uber, on a new way to regulate Uber, that if Uber had an open API, regulators could just look into it and then sort of regulate on an algorithmic basis. And the question is, working with regulators, I don't, is it realistic to assume that um, Ideally, we could help them move to a world where they inspect protocols on an algorithmic level. They uh, can sort of look at the token mechanics and design, look at how, what elements are centralized or not, and then come to conclusions about the nature of the protocol versus having a bunch of people to fill out forms. Or is that a total pipe dream? I mean, I know it's you don't. Possible. Possible. No, it's actually absolutely possible. possible. And for yes. The bank regulators seeing the future of banking, um, they, they're looking at it and the, the future of banking will be a collection of programs <coughs> as banking continues to uh, implode. And there is an experimental group at, in Washington at the OCC looking at how to regulate APIs. And we see it in the trading space. We see attempts at algorithmic, uh, look, inspecting algorithms for purposes of algorithmic trading. What that requires, you know, and what we are, at, and why we are so conflicted at this moment is because the technology is sort of raced ahead of the capability of the human beings that actually do the administration. So you have a, a unusual collection of lawyers in the room who actually understand technology. Most lawyers don't, um, most regulators don't, um, and most examiners at the examination level don't. And so that skill set will change. I'm so heartened when I meet with uh, kids at, in law schools these days because they are that convergence. Um, and they will be the new way. But right now we have a sort of disconnect in terms of capability on the examination level. Um, people just don't understand and, and people tend to fear what they don't understand. And, and most of the time people go into talks about regulating because they talk about tokens, they don't talk about the protocol. So you, you have to educate the regulators as to your protocol. I mean, we, we are taking clients to see uh, SEC, for example, we explain the protocol and why it's designed that way because the token is 
closely connected to the purpose of the protocol. You cannot just describe what your token is going to do. Uh, then it's just going to focus on the token, not looking at the protocol. And another thing I wanted to say is that uh, I don't think a particular token is born to be security or non-security. It, 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 you can design a token in dozens of different ways. I think it depends on the transaction, how you offer and sell the tokens. And, and we, we have uh, clients thinking about within one protocol, you know, very similar to what you say, that they know they face the reality that they must raise money using, you know, selling tokens. And they recognize that inevitably they have to, I say comply with security, so I don't say that the tokens are securities because the tokens are just tokens. They have to comply with securities law. Then the token coming out of that have to continue to comply with the securities law. Uh, then, then they say, well, what about I do something else, an airdrop, you know, whatever. I, I need everybody to participate in the protocol. Do I have a, can do something else? Then the question is, can you track who the end user is owning this thing? Is it doesn't have to comply with securities law, but. The fundraiser, the investor, is the only this thing have to continue to comply with security law until they really one day they become an end user. Yeah. Are you able to track that? Are you able to you know track that and then comply with security law? I, I think the problem created with jumping in either box, security or, or utility or commodity, whatever you want, is that we're starting by by losing. Um, what's the safe harbor? If we could write this from scratch, what should it look like? And the moment we say, <clears throat> let's start just with the utility side, you've already killed the number of platforms that need security-like features. From a market design perspective, those are gonna be different types of ecosystems. And <clears throat> I think thinking more about transition helps us because if you wanna start on the far end as a commodity or a utility token, you're welcome. But if you need that appreciation phase, if you need those security features, you can do that too. And the moment we step back from that and we try to pin it into something that already exists, I think we're already moving most of the big yeah. innovation. I think, I think your point is the appreciation piece needs to be preserved. So and I'm going to be a little a lawyer here, but that's very different than what a security is, right? So if you if appreciation needs to be baked in, as I noted before, I don't think that that's a problem. Just because something goes up in value does not necessarily make it. The main security. reason people are buying it is for appreciation. Well, is going to be looked as well, a security that, in the U.S. A piece that's that, yeah. the, that test. I've already. I mean, I just wrote a paper with a professor at, at Tennessee. We already outlined the safe harbor um, that works. We we thought about that. We've also outlined what a red B could look like or some sort of exemption for things that may need to. Would that allow you to replicate what venture capital does today? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, not. I, you know, uh, I don't well, know. Well, before we, we yeah. go to the top, I actually want to make your... I gap between these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Please, I'm please do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I want pull, and I want to pull in Demi for this, too, because I think he's a perfect case study. Um, so you mentioned 5 to 25% being venture fraud in the industry. Um, I would say, in terms of look and feel of these things, the SEC might say it's mostly 75 to 95% because um, teams are issuing tokens that are not useful yet. Um, they're giving them to investors. The investors are making a ton of money. And then they're often able to sell them using a VC signal um, at a 10x or a 50x markup to a retail investor. And that looks a lot like an unregistered security. So I think uh, a lot of what we can try to enforce to get that 95 to 75% number down to true 25%, because those the, the outright frauds are not going to change. Right. But the optics of the rest and how we bridge that middle gap, I think, really depends on the initial distribution and the rules of the investors, or sorry, that the entrepreneurs, uh, in many cases, have the balls to actually bake into their protocols. And I wanted to call out Demi because I think, out of the um, out of the token sales that I've seen, I think he and his team did a really good job structuring it. I know that um, Karen and Placeholder guys spent a lot of time thinking about this as well. I don't know if you can elaborate on any of, of you know, what you guys had, had structured in terms of lockups and, and you know, the way to ensure that there's long term alignment with adult, different systems. Yeah, so I think the important thing here is last September we made the decision not to do an ICO because we saw this coming. Many of our clients and users were. Uh, struggling with this current, so we think without due to regulatory uh, uncertainty, it's not a good thing to do an ICO. So, and also, you know, that one of the cases of doing an ICO is distributing, distributing the tokens to the community. But what ends up happening is like 95% of the tokens end, uh, end up in the hands of 
traders and swing traders who don't care about your coaching, which might, might end up hurting the viability of the underlying solution you're building. So um, you know, we decided not to do it. We uh, went private, and we are now thinking of mechanisms of how to distribute the tokens to the actual users and make it as a utility or a product of the underlying operating system for building rather than you know, doing a big sale event, raising a lot of money, and then seeing what happens. So as so a venture uh, capital investor, that's, that's, you know, it's actually kind of great for <laughs> everybody in our position to see the SEC pushing everybody in the direction of you know, having to go to private capital and not being able to go directly to their consumers or their creators and consumers of value. Um, the frustration is that there's a real likelihood that there's a significant appreciation in the token that gets captured by the private investors prior to it being distributed to the people that are actually going to create value in the network, and it may be a reality because it's you know I, I you know the, the, the problem I have with Aaron's framing is that regardless of what we say, um, the the SEC has told us that they cannot sanction a safe harbor because they by doing so they would basically. Be, you know, be responsible for anything that happens within that safe harbor, and they just don't want to do that. And so there will be this securities overhang no matter what, and, and so people trying to look for certainty can, can come running to traditional fundraising mechanisms like venture capital, and, and we can take advantage of that, thank you very much, um, and, and, and make an investment and participate in that appreciation. Um, but the argument that we made to the SEC was, gosh, you know, that doesn't seem like what you really want to try and do is make a bunch of rich white guys richer. You know, you want to try and, you know, you know, allow the people that are creating the value to participate in the value creation. And so that's the, that's the, you know, I mean, I think reality says we may be headed there, at least for a period of time. And, you know, and it may be a clean distinction to say, okay, Prior to utility, you know, there's a group of investors who can can you know fund these projects. Post utility, everybody can participate in, in the appreciation. But it you know it's just frustrating that you can't bring the you know the people that are actually working every day in the network to create value into that. Yeah, I guess well, that depends. But on, it, if, on if the that. investors are locked up, long with the team, this resolves a lot of the risk, right? I mean, the the the, the, the risk right now is that you are able to make an investment in many cases. This is this is subsided quite a bit, but you're able to make an investment, and then in some cases, weeks or months later, you're able to flip that. Yeah. Um, and this was a problem in 2017, but I think some of the teams that are, are structuring their tokens now, when it is a private placement, you're either on the same terms as the founding team, or you're getting pro rata rights to the treasury that they're distributing over time, which is much, much different. Yep. Um, fundamentally, I think that would, to Christian's point, really help <coughs> Uh, create a framework where projects could transition gracefully. Now, whether that happens in practice, anybody's guess, but that makes more sense in terms of the spirit of the existing laws. And until there's transparency around that um, from more teams, I think we're going to have a tough time with these are securities. I was going to add something from the point of view of a protocol designer. We're talking a lot about uh, capital raising and regulation around being able to sell tokens to raise capital. I think. Uh, protocol designers should be concerned about um, how to capture the network effects that comes from this distributed group of actors being able to enter and exit the protocol at any point in time and make their own economic decisions. And that's actually critical to how this technology can actually be so disruptive to many markets, shut down costs, bring all the benefits of, of decentralization. So I, I think Christian made that point earlier. These networks don't have a, a chance at um, providing any enhanced value on top of the incumbents if the um, protocols themselves are regulated to comply with what we consider to be traditional securities because maybe that's how the project was capitalized in the first place. So it's really important to think about responsible um, reg regulation, self-regulation with regards to capitalization without impairing the protocol's ability to deliver their value. So, there certainly are some projects that may be able to take advantage of this kind of self in protocol regulation, but I'd be concerned that if you um, have too many restrictions, then uh, you're kind of, the project may not be worth executing on uh, to begin with. Yeah, yeah, and I think that it, 
Yeah, that's exactly part of the thing we we're concerned about the, the learning a, a, a protocol for people to build apps that touch end users who you know would find it very difficult to use something like PPL uh, certainly for the, the next few years uh, is about that exact same thing like let's say we're willing to pay the price that like the social price this, for society that Brad is talking about about making venture capitalists the only one with access to the very early stage. You know, venture capital is a very risky business. You gotta invest in very risky endeavors and the, reg the regulator has decided that they wanna protect a certain group in society from doing that. And I think we can agree or disagree with that, but I'm willing to pay that price as long as we at least have a path to, to get the token out for users and for them to be able to use it seamlessly. Otherwise, it's very difficult to compete with the existing landscape of centralized players, and, and that I think is the key point, and I would happily uh, take that price at, at stage one and take it from there. Yeah, I'm also not, it's not clear to me that uh, you can't have a wide distribution of tokens to folks that uh, are purporting that they intend to use it before networks launch. This idea of functionality, it just, it's, it's not really there, and you can, you can pre-purchase a whole bunch of different goods from books. You can pre-purchase, you know, sending your kids to school, the services are not being provided. If you are actually selling a digital consumer good, and that's what you're presenting to the public in a way that it is presented that way, you can have anybody purchase it. Yeah. It's like they can purchase any good, and then they can use it when they want to use it. And investors can receive an interest in a company that is developing this good that is being sold to the public. They can receive um, you know, dividends back if there's appreciation in that good and enjoy the upside of that. Uh, the only thing that I think creates hair is when those investors, they have access to those tokens off the bat because it get, routes around 502 restrictions, right? It gives them effectively liquid stock and that can lead to abusive practices. Do I think all investors are gonna do that? Absolutely not, but I think that the, the possibility of having highly liquid private company stock is just a tool or for some and they're gonna try to run games and, and speculate and make profit off of that. And that's the, con I think that's the root concern. You can, you, can, uh, you can have this symbiotic relationship which has worked really well where you have uh, VCs and other investors really providing some, some capital early off, off, off and value. at the gate. And that obviously huge amounts of value so in terms of governance. There is, is, is the secondary market. Is there any, are there any creative ideas about somehow separating the secondary market from the primary market? Has anybody thought through that and come up with any? I, I, again, uh, you know, my clients ask me that question, and I'm a little confused as to why we would have any difficulty doing that programmatically. Um, to me, it's like an almost a non-starter. Like, of course, we can separate the primary and secondary market. We can make an ERC-20 that has any sort of restriction or regulation you can practically imagine on transfers. So why why couldn't we do that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't that's understand what TPL is. Hmm? That's, that's basically what TPL yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's it's not the you know there's plenty of people in the space who for one reason or another have had similar ideas, right? I mean, we don't. Uh, I think this is not. I, this is a weird distribution of people for me because it seems like there's a, like a lot of VCs in here. Like, but like from a technical perspective, there's no reason why you can't just put like people do and can put whatever restriction they want on an ERC twenty. It's not it's not that complicated. Like for example, I've had clients that wanted to pay me. I was developing what I consider to be a security for them, and then they wanted to pay me in that. And I'm like, well, that's great. I'm a U.S. person. I, I can't take that. Like. Oh, you can give it to me, that'll be fine, and then I'll literally, I'm not gonna get a broker-dealer license to sell my, you know, to pay my rent. Um, so, uh, <laughs> that, um, so, I, I mean, I think that you can build in those mechanisms, there's no, there's no reason um, not to, I, I think, well, okay, so I don't, is anyone here from an exchange? Okay, exchanges suck. So <laughs> the, the issue is that exchanges suck. It's not that there's any technical hurdle. They're just they're very poorly executed. They're very poorly designed um, because they're cash grabs, right? It's just like some guy who's like, "Whoa, I can throw up a MySQL database and start breaking in millions," right? So they don't have the controls or the even the interfaces internally necessary to apply the controls that you would expect from just like a, literally like an undergraduate's like final project in making an exchange would have more uh, controls and systems in place than what most exchanges 
uh, started out with, and I, I don't want to name names, I've already said they all suck, but that's, that's, the, that's the fundamental issue. I think it's the exchange's fault almost completely. It's not the, the, the applications or the end users or, or even the VCs. I really just think the exchanges uh, just didn't uh, apply the functionality because they didn't need to become billionaires, right? Well, there's only a question of standard right now. Yeah, I mean the crypto. I mean, yeah. Sorry, I meant sorry. Yeah, the not exchange exchanges, the fake exchanges. Yes. I don't know if they're on the live stream. <laughs> 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 I have a question. This, this is kind of a boring old topic, I'm sure, in securities law, but one of the challenges is. Um, Particularly at getting the token, even if it's considered a security <laughs> after a large number of people, is this what I've always viewed as an arbitrary line between accreditation and non accreditation. And so, my, my question, maybe for some folks that are talking to the regulators, is um, you know, one, one way to be able to get these things in a lot more hands of folks, and particularly in the US, is new thoughts and ideas around what makes an accredited but not accredited. I'm, I'm just curious if that topic has come up at all yeah. with regulators yes. and how that might be approached. Because in theory, if you can lower that bar to accreditation, that includes a lot more people in the, in the community. Yeah, I think that conversation is definitely. Brian, you can talk about what can you talk about what you're thinking about there? Uh, yeah, um, so there's like there's a few things that we're, um, that we're considering. Um, you know, we did a token sale back in November, December, um, and there's, it, it, you know, it highly depends, but, you know, uh, I'll, I'll talk on a few, a, a few topics. One is um, the tokens that were, um, that were sold, they can be used on the network for, you know, transactions, for domain name purchases, for uh, things like that, any kind of um, property purchase without being able to be transferred to uh, exchanges that are not regulated. Um, <clears throat> so that's one thing. Um, you know, another thing is uh, there have been we, we've we've seen different teams considering the idea of like actually um, like registering uh, their tokens with the SEC um, or like doing like Reg A plus something like that. So that's that's another option. That's being considered by uh, several. Well, that's and the reason I asked the question is it's within the framework of the Jobs Act, which would allow you to right. lower the requirements yeah. for certain kinds of registered offerings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then there's another thing that we did, which is uh, we we really wanted to distribute tokens to non-credit investors, but we couldn't, or we didn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, so what we did was we gave out vouchers for tokens. Um, that are like non-binding. There's no, uh, we didn't actually like sell anything. We didn't give away any tokens. We just it's kind of like a place in line. Like if we do a sale at, at some point in the future to not accredited investors, um, then you can redeem this voucher, um, and then you would be able to pay three thousand dollars in exchange get this this price for the tokens. So I think that was, in some sense. What we really wanted to do, we really wanted to get the token in in the hands of as many people as possible. That was one way that we saw like balancing the two things. I think the regulations restricted certain things there, and I think it's a little bit unfortunate that um, that the sale, like the sales, if if you're if you're being careful, then you can't do things like that. You can't even give out tokens if they could be securities because um, so it's not even like. I, I think I can understand the, the case of like sales a little more than a giveaway, but even giveaways are not okay. So. But if it's a commodity, you can. Right? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. I think the and so that, it's if you're just really careful, yeah. you just want to, we don't know what this is, but we're just going to buy, buy, buy all, no, all I, our licenses. How did you prevent it from being resold on the exchanges? Um, so right now, the token is not live on the blockchain. Because you know who everybody is. We know everyone has, so like, like we did, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, the part where this all breaks down from a protocol design perspective, going back to protocol design, is that what these tokens do, all of them, including Bitcoin and Ethereum, is use market forces to price digital platforms of which we don't know the value. And so the moment you distribute them or give them away and people kind of trade them and speculate them, you've killed the market ability to price those things in the first place. And that's where like it's not like a rebate on a DVD or a book. Uh, it's a completely different object. You're asking society, use your private information, your aspirations, and whatever you believe about this theme to 
prize this unknown object. Yeah. So once you kill that, I think you've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Well, yeah. I, 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 I can put the agree with that. I mean, that's the coordination. I do think that there needs to be a shift from exchanges to marketplaces. So I think part of the problem, again, is every matter, but you're trading things like cloud storage or other systems on exchanges or getting intermixed with, with things that may be treated uh, differently. So it's completely plausible that you know, Bitcoin or other, what I would call like a protocol layer token will be treated differently than something that's supporting, just because we're using this example, like decentralized file storage or, or something like that. You don't really buy file storage today from an exchange, you buy it from uh, uh, Amazon. You know, Amazon or from a marketplace, and that clarifies it. And I, I think that that's where we need to move, move forward. In the Brooklyn Project, we've actually done a lot of uh, thought around what those marketplaces can look like and how the rules can be uh, construed around it. We think that uh, a plausible way to do this is to have uh, basically a questionnaire, not that much different than topic compliance or some other compliance, where you'd attest to certain facts. There'd be there's some basic common sense approaches uh, to weed out people that clearly wanted to buy uh, what, what should be a consumer good for nefarious purposes. Uh, if they fail that check, they're basically excluded uh, from ever purchasing that product again. Um, if somebody lies to, to the party that's selling it, they're not very likely to be held liable for it. Uh, that can get enforced uh, through an ERC-20 token or some other token standards, some sort of small contract-based system. We've already made some, some strides in actually mapping that out. Uh, and that can actually get enforced through decentralized marketplaces. Uh, so the marketplaces themselves, can, if they comply and attest that standard, will be able to trade it, so it won't actually have to come from one single party. Uh, so I think those bones are in place. I, I think that there's, I will, I will square with what we have in, um, at least in the US in terms of law as well. I can ask a follow-up on that. Can I follow up on that next question? So I wonder if we need to, and I wonder if there's any possibility of changing the definition of accreditation from the perspective of what it means to be a sophisticated investor. And I think when it comes to tokens, a lot of that is around understanding technology. Yep. So I wonder if there's ways to sort of so prove that even if you have a low net, you yeah. know, relatively low net worth or low salary. Yeah, so, so there's a bill that was put through. Yeah, was it right. was approved by, I guess, the House, and it's sitting with the Senate that was not pertaining to tokens specifically, but was basically proposing an alternative method for accreditation based on sophistication. I mean, I think the rules are absurd, and I hope this is actually kind of an opportunity to reevaluate those. Like. When my partner and I started our first fund three years ago, I was literally, you know, managing tens of millions of dollars and not accredited, which made absolutely no sense and had to go through all kinds of gymnastics for it. So, I think, you know, hopefully it is an occasion to, to reassess it in the context of tokens or not. So that's what we built. We built a technical, effectively a technical accreditation test, which you can you can take. It gets uh, proven, and then it can basically resides with you uh, and controls your access to the token. So that's uh, that's been built already. Um, but how, what, what is the legal the weight that it yeah. carries? Uh, I think we're, we're working through that. Okay. And that's so part of the, uh, uh, the yeah. But that's, that's assuming that it's a commodity, right? So I have one, one question. So we're talking about separating the investor intent from the utility and usage intent, right? That's a really big deal if you want to start in the commodity pocket and not in the security pocket. Right. Another question that we've been wrestling with is to what extent does decentralization matter? So there's projects where you know you start mining and they're mined by many people independently from day one, and there's no promoter. Um, but then there's also books or concert tickets or you know tokens at a laundromat that are useful, um, but also controlled by one person. And do you think, or do we think, there's a, a, a clear legal argument that you can start in the commodities bucket uh, with consumptive intent with a central, you know, control without you fully central. I, I think you can get full decentralization. I don't see why. I don't see why if you're selling a good, you can't widely distribute that good to anybody. Well, no, but some networks are, are decentralized, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and like the players, but then some networks are different. Like I might create a bunch of ERC20 tokens and use them inside of a system. I think you can have both. I think, and I think yeah, I'm not really convinced that there's not, you know, maybe there's a pocket and there's gonna be some businesses that are more centralized. That would, no, there are. There are lots and lots of them where with real tokens that are being used every day that are not decentralized, the way Ethereum is decentralized, but they feel more like tickets to a laundry, laundromat than like stocks. Um, and so I just wanna, it feels important to be able to make space for that as well as for things that are, you know, start out like. Well, you, so you're, you're saying projects, we do have a perspective here. So yeah. Some of those projects, I, I can just say without divulging anything, 
Some of them are the types of the ones that I was mentioning that are trying to start offshore while speaking with the SEC at the same time. Um, so I think that there definitely there definitely are people thinking about that, especially if you've already pre-negotiated places that will accept the token. I also think just another thing that I was going to mention before is, and this might not be that popular, especially in this room, but no matter what we call them, whether we call them commodities or securities or anything else, getting to back to like disclosure, like certain things, like even if you have a token that will be used, you know, as a payment token or as a utility token, there may be disclosure that you might want to have that would be relevant to you if you're a purchaser. So for example, if I'm buying and I'm really going to use this in what I think is an ecosystem, okay, I'm really going to use this token, maybe I would like to know and maybe it would sway my opinion if I know that 90% of the tokens have been sold to people with a 90% discount and no lockup. Like maybe that would have an effect on whether I'd buy it, right? And so, totally. go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say like, I think I, that was, a, I think a thing that we found was like one of the biggest problems with the industry that it was so like cronyistic and so, there's like so many so many projects that would give like discounts and so many projects where like it's unclear what percentage the team owns and whatever and they would have these like deceiving charts that show like like it's like a pie graph but it's like it doesn't actually show over time what percentage it, it everything has it doesn't actually show how those things are used and i think i also love the foundation which is or the company yeah. which owns like 50 percent of the tokens separate from the the reward for the founders yes. but the entity that owns all the tokens is right. also owned by the founders so 90, i'm like oh, so actually that's 75 is what you're telling yeah. me they're like well yeah yes technically and i'm like oh well okay yeah and so one thing we tried to do is like i think we really like set a standard for you know disclosures in terms of like distributions and like wraps over time we actually we published a um like a breakdown of comparing bitcoin to ethereum to zcash to filecoin to tezos to us we just like showed like all across and we actually we actually provided disclosures for all the other projects that didn't exist before and, it, <laughs> and like those projects didn't even disclose like how much like for example i think a lot of people think that zcash took 10 percent, but they didn't they took 20 percent of the first four years and then zero percent of the next so in the first four years zcash actually owns 20 the company owns 20 percent you know the other thing is like i think most people don't realize that ethereum pre-mined 75 to 80% of all the tokens that will ever exist, and the inflation rate's extremely low. And so there's and there's there's several people who, who participated in the pre-sale who have like five to ten percent of Ethereum. So I think there's like a lot of these like these things that are kind of shady. The other thing is that, that happened is, is is in in a lot of a lot of the like really popular token sales, you have uh, these investors that come in early and they get like 50% discounts or like 75% discounts, and none of this was disclosed or like made very clear, um, and it wasn't open to everyone else. So I think this is kind of like, it's very unfair. So what we, we said, it was like, everyone should get the same price who's participating in the sale, we're gonna, we're gonna make it equal, and we're gonna make it very um, upfront about exactly what you're getting. And we also significantly reduced the percentage of tokens that are available to the company and to the shareholders of the company. Um, versus some of the tokens that are taking like a third or more of all the tokens, sometimes 90%. Um, and so I think things like that make it, or like you just gotta think about what is the goal here? Is the goal decentralization? Is the goal fairness? Is the goal equality? And like, how can we achieve that? And I think we need to um, be more hard on everyone else in the community and put pressure on them, like ask more questions and be like, no, that's not okay. That's not okay for you to take such a large percentage of tokens. That's not okay for you to allow for different investors who just came in super early to have a discount and, and buy up this percentage and then just be able to flip the tokens on the market, like what you know what, what happened with a, with a couple projects last year. If only there was a platform that would you know, rise to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll say one on thing that's okay. Sponsored by. <laughs> one observation that I have is that the community moves faster than the regulators, right? Like oh, a yes. lot yeah, faster. Absolutely. And I, I, from our conversation with the regulators, because of all the ICO madness last year, there's a lot of focus on these things as investments and as shady investments. That's like most of the focus. And so we've been, um, now we're starting to see utility happen, right? And these things are just starting to work. And so I think there's sort of two pieces that can happen in parallel that should happen. One is like a lot of education to anybody thinking about regulating this space about how these software networks work. When we go in and we say like, hey, this is not just a fundraising vehicle, it's like this new kind of software platform and it has these attributes and these properties, like people are kind of like, 
Oh, wow. <coughs> Even people who are already paying attention to this. So we all have to keep doing that and really highlight the really interesting and awesome real use cases. Um, and then I think at the same time, since we can move faster than they can, separating the bad guys from the good guys is really important. And you know, to Christian's research about like this is the percentage of real scams, you know, they're all focused on the scams. And so if the folks who are building real technology with real utility can do the stuff Brian's talking, that both Brian's are talking about, um, and sort of try to work toward a set of good practices that we can point to, I think if we can do both of those things in parallel, it'll help the conversation with regulators everywhere. So the biggest point though is that, as, as Ryan pointed out, there are a lot of really good projects, really good developers who are gonna ship really amazing things that really fucked up their ICO and, and look like scams. Because they yeah. were in some ways scams. Yeah. We're, we're investors in a couple of them, I'll admit it, right? Like, it wasn't right the way they did it. We encouraged them to do it a different way, but they did it the way they did it for whatever reason. That's, that's bad. Because they those good projects have actually tainted. It sounds like Ethereum, some of you might even put into that category, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Admitted that. I, I he, he said that he would do things very differently if you were doing it today. Right, and yes. so that's, the, I think in some ways, the industry needs a mea culpa. Like, look, a lot of great projects have been funded poorly. We gotta stop doing that. That's a big part of what has to happen here. And, and so I wanna follow up on that point, because that's, that's an important point, this sort of mea culpa and not not explicitly pointing fingers and going back to the point of a crypto asset in the first place, right? Which, if we look at Bitcoin as the mother, um, or the first example, Bitcoin had no sale, right? It gives away an asset at a fixed cadence um, in exchange for the secure clearing and settling of Bitcoin transaction. It's very simple. And so from the second that that asset existed, it was being given in exchange um, for the supply side of some sort to come and provide that service. And so I guess the question I have for us as a group, certainly we have to go back and revisit what has been done, but is organic mining clearly a safe space? Is it clearly a commodity? Because without it, you know, there's no utility that works. And I would I add to that, is venture capital or, or funding of all of these projects fundamentally problematic? to their core So let's come to that. Let's start with mining, though. Does it feel like mining? Can those two things? Why don't VCs uh, fund mining, right? Doesn't that solve the problem? We can do that, or there can be a Zcash-style situation, um, right, where you are really funding a, a, a company. It's an equity-style deal up front to build a protocol to actually organically mine. The, the only issue with that is that the way that that works is they have an email list that they sell the Zcash to which further constrains the number of players that get access to the special deal of Zcash that's getting released. So what it actually does is it leads to further consolidation versus open sales. For, right. for Zcash, yeah. specifically on infrastructure. No, no, okay. so, so, and we consider that model too. Right. And we could have done it more that way and like, like not done a token sale and actually only took like a bigger chunk and then slowly drifted out over time. But, and there's, there's, there's just pros and cons. We have to realize that that's a centralizing force, mm -hmm. right? So early on, yes, definitely. So I want to hear from Sandra and from Wendy. A bit more about your point. I think a lot of what you brought up earlier was separation of intention and investing to intention of using. And one of the beauties about this space is those two are linked. And I don't think they can be completely separate. And in, intention of investing with your time as an early adopter taking risk on platform, if that's the beauty of mining. And do those investors need to be protected the same way a financial investor that risks their financial capital needs to be protected? I think that's a question that we can't answer by following these commodity and securities definitions. So what I, if, if we buy your point, which is that mining is sort of safe from a regulatory perspective, and I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'd love to hear from the lawyers in the room, but what I've understood about mining of things like, let's use Bitcoin as an example, is that there's sort of a randomness factor and it's kind of like a lottery. And so for that reason, you're not, you know, you're being rewarded kind of randomly. So maybe it's, and it seems to be that there's an understanding it's not a security. Then it's it seems to me that there's a, there's a, there's a yeah. potential solution here, right? And that, that this is something, the, the beautiful trade off is that you are creating value for the network by providing that supply side, as you said, and you're being rewarded for doing it. So if someone brought this up a moment ago, why don't we have a model where investors invest in mining rigs and you're kind of, it kind of works. Or whatever yeah, utility the, the network exactly. wants to provide. Proof That's the supply side, right. right? And so as we get deal. more into proof of stake right now, we've been very focused deal. on machine work. We're going to transition more and more right. to human work as the supply side. Right. And so I think finding more ways 
to issue directly in exchange for that supply side, whatever it may be, um, providing utility. And Live Peer has a great example of this, right? You guys need people to do encoding, and you reward them, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. the investment is work, too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the question. Where the, where's the line? Right, that's what I'm line. asking. This, is, this gives the lie to, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but. Mining is actually a, a bit of a blurry term. Maybe you want to just like clarify it. Like, sure. I guess the way I, I think of um, this general organic mining model is more that you mint new units of the crypto asset and give it away, not in the style of an airdrop as we think of it, but you give it away in exchange for some supply side actor to provide the utility that the network purports to provide. And so every network comes out saying we are XYZ and in order for XYZ to actually exist, Presumably, they need a decentralized set of actors to actually provide that service. Machines and humans. Machines and humans. Some networks prioritize machines, some prioritize humans as the supply side. If you look at EOS, it's actually pretty right in the middle in terms of a hybrid model. So their mining protocol, you deposit, uh, you send money to an address that the, the block one owns, and they get to do something with it. Kind of looks like a token sale. Kind of, kind of looks like mining because you know every single day there's a there's a period and you get a percentage of the awards based on that. So I, th I would say that's the thing that's closest to halfway in the middle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. I have a topic. So we're talking about <coughs> nation states in terms of regulation mainly. Um, are we ready to go off regulation but still nation state for the last ten? Yeah, minutes? we've got about <laughs> ten or fifteen minutes. I so, imagine Joel might 15. sum it up a little at eleven twenty-five. So if, yeah. we, if we fast forward and we assume that some of these protocols will become uh, mission critical to markets and societies, right? That's, that's I guess why we're in the room. Um, one of the fun conversations that came up yesterday was, will protocols have sort of roughly cultural and geographic boundaries? And there is a case to be made that you'll have a different set of protocols in China and Russia than maybe in the West. And so having power and influence um, over governance of, of these networks can become a huge big strategic question for nation states, right? So if you assume Bitcoin will do another 20x and Ethereum, something like Ethereum will do another several hundred times x if, if it has a functioning application layer, is there a role for nation states to uh, protect protocols mm. and own big chunks of, yeah. of the protocols or just let China do it, or <laughs> they already <laughs> are doing it? Um, and are there other ways that nation states will be confronted with having to be a, a, an active member of the protocol versus sitting back and saying, we don't understand it? Yeah. Just to add to that, there's also an interesting question in like, the Bitcoin community today, what if the Chinese government to pick on China, right? Were to step in and sort of take over mining of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, the, the good, the good news is right. actually the crackdown on mining is for some of these miners to ship offshore. So yeah. Yeah. Santiago, yeah, Santiago. Yeah, Santiago. Yeah, Santiago. <laughs> what's what's going on in Venezuela? I think gives us a clear picture of what's happening when a nation state declares a direct war against these protocols. For the first two years before announcing the Petro, the Venezuelan government directly attacked at Bitcoin miners. Violently by sending the secret police, charging them with the trial to the revolution and whatnot, taking their passports. The way they were able to identify Bitcoin miners in Venezuela is by simply looking at the electricity footprint. Uh, so, proof of work, censorship resistant, not so sure about that. <laughs> uh, so, and, and that's a serious concern. If proof of work still you know, has this energy demand, I think you know, we should put more emphasis on RD related to the hardware aspect of proof of work. Um, uh, but uh, you know, all of the expropriated hardware, then the Venezuela government announced the Petro. Uh, and uh, you know, Petro is probably a, a device for money laundering, cocaine money from you know, Maduro and, and, and his cronies. Uh, but certainly, he's giving a very clear picture of what happens when a nation state declares a war against Bitcoin and, and, and this product. Yeah, uh, what I mean is kind of, I get that a little different, but let's just assume. Wall Street starts running on Ethereum, for example. Yes. Um, <laughs> 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 and and there's going to be a whole bunch of um, nation state actors that are going to have an interest to be able to control the way Ethereum works. And so, for example, the US But then you can slash them if they misbehave. Yeah, we, I mean, I just, so I just mm -hmm. tweeted out a multi year book project with a co author. Uh, last chapter, we talked exactly about this. I, I think that 
his conversation is going in that over the time. As these networks become larger, there's different um, levers that governments will be able to apply pressure on. Uh, and I think one of them is actually actively participating in these networks, taking a larger stake. I, I think that it's an open question whether or not that's a good or bad thing. You know, uh, you basically politicize um, that, the networks at that point. Um, that could be helpful in terms of stability. Um, it could be helpful in terms of governance, rolling up updates uh, that are sensible, putting in mechanisms in place that people would expect for valuable assets. But I, I definitely think that that's happening. And I think it's actually going to be a little more complicated than that because I don't think it's necessarily going to be about whether it's controlling Ethereum. I think it's going to have layers of um, application and protocols above the actual fundamental layer, and that is to play for. And I think that gets very political. And I think we've only just seen the beginnings of what that starts to look like. Um, TPL being an example, I've just heard of, which is great. Uh, but I think we're already going to have that. So that sort of nation state uh, politicizing of this tech is, in my mind, already starting to happen. Um, what's interesting to me is small countries that you would not think um, would be prominent in this space are now coming up and saying they want to be your next tech hub of blockchain or whatever have you. And actually, from a democratization standpoint, I kind of like that. The Caribbean, tiny islands, you know, you may not even know where they are in the middle of the Pacific. They're all talking about it. So I think we should look to see ways for us to actually help those nation states uh, build out their tax. Um, it's not just about China, even though I do agree. The idea of currencies, like the Ethereum crypto. I think the other, the other point to think about that is if you actually want to onboard significant value, which is a vision, right? So if you really want to onboard a token identity kind of security, you want it for real property, you, uh, and assuming that or in some still proof of work type system, you actually need uh, state actors to get involved in order to provide that uh, security. To actually up it so that only uh, you know uh, even state actors won't be able to, to you know, muck around or perform some sort of attack on the system. I think the other piece that you also need to think about is you can do indirect attacks, uh, so you can do currency manipulation effectively. Uh, so you don't necessarily even need to participate in mining. You could basically buy and sell large blocks and make the price you know crash it, create instability in order to affect the operation of these markets. So I think governments can do a lot, and I think we'll continue to see them do a lot over time uh, as they begin to take a And then the, 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 the other piece for governments will have a significant amount of control is just the, the lack of uh, anonymity, right? So I, I'm not fully convinced that we're not going to see a, one or more states balkanize um, something like the Bitcoin blockchain or some other or some other example because they can start just tracing through it, right? And you can start blocking accounts and creating blacklists and do exactly what happened with IP addresses in, in China. So I had a um, I was going to say, regarding uh, what governments can do, I'm from the New York City Economic Development Corporation, so we're the economic engine of the city. We're not regulators, so I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> um, but regarding what the city right now is looking into blockchain and the crypto space, trying to figure out how we could support the private sector, how we could support companies in this space as well. So I want to put that out there as we're thinking about some of these you know, smaller uh, nation states that are you know, growing their tech hubs. We want to make sure that New York City remains a place that's conducive to tech development. We know that, you know, in addition to what's happening in, in terms of the bit license, um, we're, we're trying to identify what we can do to support this ecosystem in this community. So if it's con convening regulators, if it's having a space to have these ongoing types of conversations, you know, I just want to put this out there, you know, please come see me or let's have this ongoing conversation and discussion because that's what we're here to support. One thing I'll, I'll point out when I hear folks from public sector talk about interest in blockchains, uh, they're interested in data integrity, um, you know, transparency, all auditability, all the good things about it. And so I always try to connect folks who are interested in that part with folks on the regulatory side who are scared of all the other weird, scary things about cryptocurrencies. And so that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And as part, just to kind of give it just a bit of context, as part of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, what we do is we try to figure out whether it's through capital investments, real estate investments, infrastructure investments, how we support the private sector. So some examples are we're behind Cornell Tech um, that grew here in New York. Um, also, there's a half billion dollar life science initiative that we uh, yeah. are, are, are working on, as well as a $30 million cybersecurity initiative for workforce development or you know, investments in in, um, in companies that are starting in this space. So it's not just necessarily from a, a privacy standpoint or an open data standpoint, but how can we support 
businesses in this space as well. One bad regulation like the bid license will so outweigh a billion or two billion or three billion dollars of investment in, in economic yeah. development. And that's what's happened. It's unfortunate. Yeah. We, yeah. we tried to block it, it happened, and it's fucked. And, and what we're thinking about is how we're going to do that. Amen to that. Yeah. It's 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 not, it's not it's it's a waste of time. The state's done what they're done, and they're not going to change. And people are going to move to other places. You moved to another place, right? We moved to New Jersey. Right. It's good. It's done. The damage is done, and you can't fix it, unfortunately, because New York City can't fix New York State. New York State is the worst. It's the most corrupt state in the country. So let's just talk. About <laughs> 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 Albany is just corrupt. It's all. Like, okay. So back to the question. Yeah. Yeah. because it really means that there will not be a permissionless blockchain uh, in China, um, which I think is a real mistake on their part. Um, and I think it opens up uh, an era of competition, which is going to, you know, sort of, obviously they leapfrog uh, the West in terms of low-cost manufacturing and created and brought a whole lot of people out of poverty in that, with that great mechanism. But they're kind of shooting themselves to the foot by shutting down the next wave of, of innovation. Well, and they're also forcing a lot of brilliant entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. uh, for the early miners and people yep. like Bitmain and others, to move out. They will land somewhere, and where they land will be a real gift to those places. Singapore, one of the places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think finance is a great example of this, right? right. One yeah. of the one of the real innovative things that have come out of China recently are some of the exchanges, will be finance, et cetera, et cetera. They went from China to Japan, if I remember correctly, and then now they're in Malta, so maybe okay. they're going to land in Malta. What's going on in Venezuela? It's very likely an experiment of the Chinese. Uh, okay. Because like most of the investment they had were came from China. But what's also interesting is the rest of the nation could fork away the balance of the government, and then everyone could pay attention to the fork. And then, just, <laughs> and then the government is bankrupt. Wait, the entire That's Chinese nation? I'm missing that. <laughs> what? This is what revolution will look like in there. Yeah, so you can, you can actually fork away the, the balance and then everyone else moves. It's like C class. Yeah, C class. Yeah, exactly. So the we're coming over on 1130, and I know that we can keep going for hours, and um, we have about 30 minutes before the lunch, is that right? Or we can all filter down to the restaurant. So we have the restaurant from 1130 to 1 um, for dinner. So sit wherever you want. It's all open for us. So we can keep the conversation going there. We can decentralize it a bit. <laughs> keep it going over here lunch. Uh, it is not filmed, so you can use the comp. There's a camera right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my favorite thing about this space is that whenever there's a deep conversation like this one, I, I personally always come out with more questions than answers, which just makes me believe that there's more stuff to work on, which is great, and that means I still have a job. And this is one of those situations where there's a bunch of new things that I at least haven't thought about. Uh, that came out of this conversation. One that sticks to mind is this realization that if you over-regulate, you, you kill uh, the one of the most important aspects of, of, this, of these networks, which is the governance aspect of it. 
Uh, I had always thought about overregulation is going to prevent the value appreciation and the trading and all of that, but it really also kills at one of the most important things in, in this space. Um, the it other doesn't thing, kill it, it forces it somewhere else. It forces it somewhere else or, or it, it undermines it, it, it is perhaps the right word. Um, the other insight for me... But there are uh, also people who would decide not to do it just because they don't want to go through the trouble. Exactly, exactly. And so you're, you're really undermining the ability for the community to build um, the things that we're trying to build, that we're promising to build. And the second is uh, data. And data is always some, an argument that we've, more data, more open data is an argument that we've always brought to the conversation with regulators. We've always brought it from the point of view of, hey, with this technology, you have more data, you have more information in real time, you can inspect it. What you're lacking is the tools to properly understand and analyze this data. But something that I'm realizing is that it, that can also come back to bite you. Uh, the mm -hmm. example of Venezuela using energy patterns to determine who the miners are and then going after them is something that I, I didn't know about. And it, it made me think about uh, how do we, and then it's a, it's a point that, would, that was also brought up in terms of, you know, if we force everyone to do these KYC things, who's keeping that information safe? Who's, who's safeguarding that? So I think there's a lot to think about in terms of uh, the kinds of data that we're putting on chain and how is that data uh, protected or distributed or encrypted in such a way that uh, we remain in control and uh, we're promising these technologies that uh, promote more control by the network, more, more power to the network. Um, but we, we do that by open sourcing more and more data, uh, but we also have to be conscious about, uh, you know, there's two extremes. There's too much data, too little data, and we have to find a middle ground. Um, so those are my takeaways. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many people will have uh, other takeaways, but uh, we have 30 minutes to hang out, or we can start filtering down and go. Yeah, so, well, I, I, I'm I, sorry. Are I, there I, any MSB money service business or KYC experts around? Sort of. yeah. I, I was interested to see the whole regulatory discussion take place and no one kind of talked about that angle, which I think will be... So maybe let's split and, and what people can do is you're welcome to stay here. There's also a roof if no one's seen the roof. You're welcome to go down to eat. It's going to be buffet basically 11.30 to 1. Um, and so really this is time for us to sort of mingle and eat or go on the roof or whatever you want to do. Um, great. Thanks everyone. Great.